stealing a line here from Reverend Zach Mills. If you help me, Hyde Park Union Church, if you help me this morning, I won't have to work so hard. <clears throat> Will you pray with me? Oh God, thank you for your living waters. Oh God, not my words, but yours. Not my words, but yours. May all of us be comforted and convicted. Not my words, but yours. Amen. One of my ordination texts was from the book of Esther, chapter four. In it, Esther's adoptive father, Mordecai, is talking to her about her newfound position of power. And he says to her, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. For such a time as this. I chose this verse, this passage, because as I approached my ordination, I kept wondering what does it mean to be ordained in such a time as this? What does it mean to be ordained in a pandemic? What does it mean to be ordained during a movement for racial justice? What does it mean to say yes to God in the midst of turmoil and grief? I returned to this verse this week because I had a similar question. What does it mean to be irreverent in such a time as this? What does it mean to pastor in a moment of domestic terror and insurrection? There may be some preachers this morning who don't talk about what happened on Wednesday at the Capitol. I'm not going to be one of them. I believe that this is part of my job. It's part of those ordination vows that you all just saw me take. It's part of my job to speak to what is happening in our world. Or in the world of Chance the Rapper, it's my job to speak to God in public and speak to God about the public. It is my sacred responsibility this morning to hold together the events of this week and our texts and tradition, to speak to what God has allowed me to see. I see that Wednesday was an astonishing display of white supremacy. This is not a new topic for our congregation. We've been talking about white supremacy and anti-racist practice for months, but I want to be very clear about what I mean this morning. I'm quoting here a definition from Dr. Reggie Williams. White supremacy is the manufacture and maintenance of systems and structures for whites only. Hatred and harm are always secondary effects of this primary thing, a longing for an idealized community populated by a fetishized white ideal. The mob that descended upon the halls of the Capitol this Wednesday were driven by a fetishized ideal of white supremacy. Driven by an ideology that cannot tolerate a plural United States. Driven by an ideology that will destroy everything in its path before allowing a liberated and equitable society. And the response they were met with, or perhaps I should say the lack of response they were met with, is a striking example of how white supremacy is embedded in the institutions of this country. It is glaringly evident to anyone who has seen the news of the past year that the legitimate protests of Black Lives Matter, of disability advocates, 
of those advocating for indigenous land rights receive violent shows of force. While a white mob literally attempting insurrection received first and foremost nonviolent tactics, quasi indifference, and even in some profoundly disturbing cases, direct support. And I see that what happened on Wednesday is not separate from our life as a church and our life as Christians. We can't afford to pretend otherwise. We don't get to draw a circle around our religious life so that we can keep ourselves comfortable. We don't get to block out the events of the public square. Because the truth of the matter is that Christianity had a role to play in this. Many of those participating in Wednesday's attack did so in the name of Jesus. If I sound angry and upset this morning, it's because I am. They did so in the name of Jesus Christ. Not the Jesus of the gospel. Not the Jesus whose very birth we celebrated just 16 days ago, but the Jesus that white American Christianity has created in its own image. The Jesus that has been used to justify slavery and segregation and Holocaust and Nazism and extreme poverty and homelessness and white supremacy. We as Christians, especially those of us who are white Christians, have to acknowledge that Jesus has been used to justify this. And we have to decide what we're going to do about that. And I see that all of this occurred on a holy day. Wednesday was epiphany. Believe it or not, Wednesday was the 12th day of Christmas. The day when we celebrate the Magi's arrival to the infant king. I want to read the epiphany story as it's told in the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall become a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After, after listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy and going into the house they saw the child with Mary his mother and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you for Herod is going to search diligently for the child and destroy him. And Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I will call my son. 
Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. That's, that's the epiphany story. A story that tells us of a threatened ruler. A ruler who's so desperate to hold on to his power that he orders the slaughter of innocent children. A ruler who will try every psychological trick in order to maintain his position. A ruler who incites violence without qualm. And it tells us of others in positions of power who work alongside him. It's a story, the epiphany story is about power and the fear of losing it. It's a story about oppression. It's a story about violence. And it's a story about God. You see, God is still in the story. God was in the story then. And God is in the story now. Wednesday was epiphany, and epiphany is the season of appearings, of revelations. The revelation of that star to the magi, the revelation of Emmanuel, God with us. The revelation of an escape for the holy family to a safety. The revelation that Herod's power, as great as it was, could not conquer God's. So my first question for you this morning, Hyde Park Union Church, is what appeared to you this week? What revelations did you have? What did God make clear to you in this, the season of epiphany? For some, it was the true demonic depth of white supremacy in this country. It became clear to what perverse lengths white America will go to preserve that twisted reality. For some, it was the fragility of our society. It became clear that structures and processes have been taken for granted, that one can't assume that things will go peacefully or without interruption. But if you found yourself shocked or surprised this week, I need you to know that many people did not. There are Black communities, Brown communities, Indigenous communities, queer communities that have known this violence firsthand and who raised alarms long before Wednesday. What appeared to you this week? What was revealed? For me, I was again reminded of my immense privilege and of my responsibility. And I would be lying if I said that I'm before you all this morning in a place of internal calm and peace, having processed everything and came to a place of trust. I'm not. <laughs> I come as frazzled and fragile as all of you, but I can say, what I can say is that in the midst of it all, God has revealed hope to me. I wanna to turn to the scripture that Christina read for us this morning from the book of Acts. This is a scene from Paul's ministry in Ephesus. And it's a scripture that asks a specific question. It asks, what does it mean to be a Christian? It's clear from the text that the theology and practice of Christianity was still very much in formation at that time. In the text, Paul comes upon a group of disciples and asks them if they have received the Holy Spirit. To which they respond, no, we haven't heard of the Holy Spirit. Let's pause for a second right there and take that in. These disciples hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. They had not heard of it. 
You see, it turns out these disciples had received the baptism of repentance, but not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they had received the teachings of John the Baptist. They had felt the call to repent their sins and to prepare themselves for the coming of Christ, but they hadn't yet received the full teachings of Jesus and the blessing of the Holy Spirit. So Paul talks with them. And he baptizes these 12 in the name of Jesus, and he lays his hands upon them. And the disciples receive the Holy Spirit, and they begin to prophesy and speak in tongues. I know that this can be kind of a confusing passage, but I want us to understand two extremely important things this morning. Two things that reveal hope to me on this Sunday. First, Christian fellowship involves change. These disciples were willing to be corrected, to learn, and to grow. They were honest about what they didn't know. They were open to further revelation. And when it comes, it changes their lives. We can't overlook what these disciples did because it's not easy. There are many who will look at the revelations of this week and choose not to accept them. Will choose not to see. But church, that's not what Jesus asks us to do. Jesus asks us to be honest and to repent of our mistakes and to change and to grow so that we might all live more fully. And second, second, from this passage, we learn that the Holy Spirit is essential to our Christian identity. It's part of what makes us people of faith. And what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, the scripture says it allows us to prophesy. All of us, not just Paul, not just ordained clergy, not just the disciples. The text tells us that to be Christian, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ is to receive the Holy Spirit and to prophesy. And when I use the word prophesy, I don't mean tell the future to be able to know what will happen. Actually to prophesy means to speak about the present moment. It means to speak about now, to speak about what is happening and what God is doing and how God is still in the story. To speak about God's name on behalf of God's work in the world. Beloved, God is still in the story. It might not feel that way, but I promise God is still in the story. God is still in our story. God is at work in the world right now. God is laboring in the world right now. And our job, beloved, our job is to talk about it. Our job is to tell each other, to tell our friends, to tell our community what God is doing so that we can all join in. I asked you earlier what was revealed to you this week. So my second question, rather my charge is to tell you to speak about it. I charge us to be a prophetic church in 2021, to tell what God is doing. If God revealed sources of comfort to you this week, tell someone about it. If God revealed the need for you to take a break, tell someone about it. If God showed you what this country really is, tell someone about it. If God showed you a renewed passion for justice, tell someone about it. Go tell it. Tell it on the mountain. Tell it at the dinner table. Tell it in your group chat. Tell the good news because our world needs to hear it. We need to see and share the revelation. Go forth and do. Amen.